Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Glowplasma231 here, and today I'm here to continue the series on the channel of talking about weekly shonen jump issues. Today covering issue number 33 of 2022. Now, I feel like this was a really good weekend jump. I mean, this not only is the 55th anniversary of the Shonen Jump magazine itself, as we can see from the banner image this week, which is just a really cool banner image featuring a sort of collaboration of all of the series in the magazine right now all. Um, I don't really feel like counting them. I'm sort of working on counting them. Um, about, what does it seem to be, like 21 series in the magazine right now? So all of sort of the main characters from them, each wearing a shirt that says every Monday, being that in Japan, Shonen Jump does come out on Monday. So that's, this is a really cool cover spread just showing off everybody and also giving us the idea of where the rankings are for each of these series with obviously the characters closer to the front having more of a prevalence in the magazine but there were a lot of really good chapters this week not only do we have like my hero academia's ninth anniversary and the end of sort of a big climactic fight there but we also get a bunch of more interesting reveals just throughout it of oh what's happening in the ichinosis family deadly sins and Oh, look at that. Are Taiki and Chinat's going to have something fun going on in Blue Box? And not even to mention the um, Naruto spinoff, Naruto The World Within the Spiral. The special one shot that came off, came out this week, which is the sort of big climax to the Naruto Top 99 big poll where um, Masashi Kishimoto, the author of Naruto, pretty much said, Yeah, I'll draw a short manga about whoever's in first place. And this is what we got for it, but I think this was a really good issue of Jump, and as usual, I'm going to be going through my thoughts on all of these series that I re read in the magazine, which this week it is a 14, but 15 if you count the Naruto one-shot, which I did read, and since it did come out in the magazine, I am going to talk about it. It's not like a Spy Family or any of those Jump Plus titles that also come out on Sunday, but aren't actually part of Jump itself. I just like to stick to what's in Jump. Um, as you go through chapters, I'm going to talk about what I want in them, like, what's going on there. And at the end of the video, I'm going to say what my favorite chapter was, what my least favorite chapter was. And just go through everything in between, because I do rank every chapter on a sort of ranking basis. And also, I pick a character of the week. Who is my favorite character? And I'll mention that at the end, too. So if you just want to hear that, you can jump straight to the end. But just to get started, since we have a lot of good chapters this week... Let's just go and hop into it with My Hero Academia, chapter number 394. Now, this chapter is sort of the big climax to the Toga and Uraka fight, and it is just a very entertaining chapter with just Uraka and Toga just going back and forth. We've got a lot of really weird imagery in it, too, and there's a whole thing where eventually Toga and Uraka get talking about that sort of chat about romance and love thing that just been hammered into us this entire time and eventually toga sort of brings up the point of well um deku or Izuku reminds me of a boy i used to like his name was sato and oh that's pretty cool no but my just my favorite part of this is that done this sato kids we see yeah he does look like deku deku but he is wearing a shirt that also says sometimes tuesday which I just find funny because the whole thing of the cover of Shonen Jump is the every Monday, like every Monday of a week, weekly uh, sh issue of Weekly Shonen Jump out for you. But it's just like sometimes Tuesday. It's a really fun Easter egg in the chapter that sort of like the Kochikame, um, whenever it ended. I think, what was that? 20, ooh, 2017 or whenever it was? No, 2016. I think it was 2016. Whenever um, all of the chapters in Shonen Jump had that Kochikame reference. You don't really understand that unless you were reading it at the time. And this is just one of those fun things. But as we keep going through it, there's a thing of more about Uraka thinking Toga's smile is the cute cutest thing in the world. And at the very end of the chapter, all of the Twice blood goes away. And at the very end, all of the Trice clones disappear. And this is a very good chapter of my hero. Sort of ending out this whole conflict between it. And a very interesting way to end off this whole fight between Toga and Uraka, and yeah, that's out of the picture now, so I thought this was a really good chapter, and it was a good end to this sort of battle of this final arc here. 
Next chapter I read was One Piece, chapter 100, or not 100, 1087, where we have a really cool um, cover page. I didn't even mention my Heroes cover page, which being, yeah, it's the ninth anniversary of the series. We just got have a really cool co color page, just seeing everybody sort of like fancy outfits is poor coach who normally likes to draw them. And I like how sort of in the back we even see um, Hagakure's face sort of in full color. That's pretty interesting, along with, uh, of course, all of our main Class 1A. We also have Zala, and in the very back, we see All Might sort of staying triumphantly and looking away. And we still haven't cut back on All Might after the whole thing that was going on a few chapters ago, so what about that? But like I said, next is One Piece, where we have a really awesome chapter that is about sort of Garp and Aokiji sort of going at it. We sort of get this idea of where... Garp and Aokiji used to um, pummel holes into ships, and Aokiji was pretty much trained by Garp, and now the two of them are very much fighting. And of course, you have Avalo Pizarro, who is in the um, full lead pirate I, I Full lead, that's such a good name for an island, a pirate island in One Piece. It's just so awesome. But pretty much, we see that Garp gets stabbed through and very wounded throughout this entire thing, but yeah. Garp's gonna survive, and it was just a really awesome chapter with Garp just really looking cool throughout the entire thing. Next up is Black Clover, chapter number 365, where, yeah, last time Sekere sort of used her ceiling magic to seal up everybody's wounds and to sort of help everybody get back up to fight against the Paladin, um, Demontio, or whatever you call him. And everybody's just fighting more about, again, that against him. Um, Charmy actually comes out and shows off her big werewolf form, but immediately just gets screwed over. We see Locke and we see Magna going at it. We even see Zora going to punch him out. But we also see that Demontio has been gifted atmosphere magic and saying that you'll be judged by an invisible power to sort of crushing away everybody. And eventually we see that Sekere is just sitting here and she's just like, oh my gosh, everybody's getting destroyed. Like all of the friends who helped me out through all of this, they're just getting mortally wounded. And she's like, no, this can't be happening. As Ost appears out of nowhere. And he's just like, you guys, thank you. As Ost is here again, walking away. And we sort of see how Sekere looks at him the same way as she looked at the first wizard. Yeah, first wizard king. I Lumiere, was that his name? I think that was his name. If Oh, I, I think it is, possibly. It's been a while since I went back and read Black Clover. But Ost is here. Ost is going to screw up Dementio in the next chapter and go on to do some other cool stuff and fight. It's going to be a really awesome chapter, I think. So, it's awesome that Ost is back in the series. And I feel like the Black Bulls really got owned here. And I hope this isn't the final thing they do since Black Clover is obviously... This is its final battle, right? There isn't going to be much on Black Clover after this. So I hope this wasn't the last we see of the Black Bulls. I hope they do a bit more and all just sort of getting crushed so Asta can appear. But whenever Asta does appear, it is just a really awesome moment. Next chapter is Undead Unluck, chapter 167. Where, okay, we get sort of get a little bit of Thing backstory. As Thing and Shin are getting ready to face off in their rough and tumble final round of this big championship. And they're pretty much going through how the two of them are fighting. And we see that, yeah, Shin's in Locked on Truth, so he's getting ready to go and beat Sh um, Fang. And we sort of get so a lot of Fang backstory throughout this, as we sort of see that Fang got his negator ability, which is obviously Unfade, which you actually don't know until this point if you've just been reading the weekly manga because it's never brought up besides for just a few volume extras and i know that because i've collected the volumes of undead luck physically in english and this is a translation note in the back of them and so we're finally actually seeing shing's uh, or things unfade in the story so that's pretty interesting and just sort of seeing how he's do it how his tragedy is sort of wrapped in that his tragedy is that he will always be his pink strength. So even if he wants to become the strongest, even if somebody surpasses him, there won't be any vibe for him to surpass. He will always be the strongest around. And seeing how that sort of is his own tragedy. And eventually, 
um, Shin on doing his ninth gate, the ninth um, appendix of his um, power system, sort of unlocking that gate and sort of getting that blood red color all over his body, sort of reminding me whenever he got turned to that Zhang Shi, sort of that same exact color thing. I don't know if this is like the reference to that, but we pretty much see that, yep. Yeah, Shin beats the crap out of Fing, and we sort of get some more Fing story of just, like, how whenever he was younger and he originally fought in this tournament and won the title, his rivals were sort of younger, but then as time has passed, they're all old, old and decrepit and can't really fight as well anymore. And Fing is just saying, there, he's like, how are you able to stand or smiling when it's you has lost? Is sort of showing his own negator tragedy as it goes on. And, yeah, Shin comes in beats the crap out of him, and yeah, what's going on here is Fing is sucking the wall, but Shin's untruth is keeping him there so he can't get out, and Shin wins. It's just an awesome chapter through and through, and this was just a really good chapter for Undead Luck, presumably wrapping up this whole martial arts storyline, which is a little sad because I have really enjoyed it. It's really been what I've, what I've been looking for in Undead Luck, and I'm sort of sad to see it go. Next chapter is the Ichinose's Family Deadly Sins, chapter 33, where we get some more stuff with, yeah, Sota doesn't exist anymore, and what happened to him, and we sort of get a lot of a prelude that, yeah, Sota seems like he may be dead because he helped him out whenever the whole car crash thing happened, and yeah, is Sota dead? And we sort of get that, um... Tsubasa was like, man, he's gone forever. I, I'll never get to see my big brother again. And my family pushed him away. And he's like, I love seeing Soda smile, but all I can remember now is a childlike heartbreak on his face whenever he saw that broken camera. And we just see that Tsubasa is like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. As eventually he's just walking through like the television section in like a Walmart or something. This is Walmart is on a head cannon it as. As we see that there's somebody who looks like Soda on the television screen. Saying like, hey, I've got to say, the ocean is really incredible. We're here for our kid and he absolutely loves it. It just screams the summer. And like this infomercial is showing Sota here with like his family. He's got like his own wife and kids. And Tsubasa sees it and is like, wait, is Soda still alive? And that's where we're in the chapter. It's such like a roller coaster of emotions being like, okay, is Sota dead? Did the family really drive him away? Oh no. Soda actually may still be alive, and Tsubasa may be able to reconcile with him, and his family may be able to heal after all this is together. So it's just a really interesting chapter, and being that I've really enjoyed this whole dynamic with Sota learning how he's part of the family and how that is evolving throughout the entire story, I'm very excited for next week's chapter, and yeah, what's going to happen? Is Soda going to confront Tsubasa, or is Tsubasa going to confront Soto? What's going on here? It's just really fun. But at this point, it's finally time for me to talk about the Naruto one-shot. The World Within the Spiral. Special one-shot of the Naruto 99. I think I explained it at the end of the episode. I'm sure you don't are sitting here to hear me talk about it. But just to say this, I actually haven't finished Naruto, right? I have read a good, good portion of the series uh, like, I think I've read to, like, the beginning of the Fourth Great Shinobi War, and sort of I stopped off there, like, I'll read the rest at some point, I've just never gotten back to it in, like, I don't know, two or three-ish years? But, I know enough about Naruto to know what's going on here, and decided to read this one shot, and being that I'm not really a fan of Naruto through and through, I thought it was fun to read about, and... Yeah, I'm sure the fans of Naruto are really excited about it, but sort of seeing the whole dynamic between, um, ooh, what is her name? Kushina, and, um, oh, boy, um, Minato, yes, those are two characters. Just seeing their dynamic throughout the whole thing, and just how they love each other, and just the whole thing of, I don't want to lose you, and, oh, making their a Sengon, and, oh, that's pretty cool. Look at that, that's fun. And just the whole end of the chapter where, oh yeah, look at um, Minato's head there, right next to the rest of the stone statues. It's pretty fun. And as a person that doesn't really care about Naruto too much, I really did enjoy most of this. And yeah, it was fun. So that's really all I have to say about it. And I mean, just to the next chapter.
Next chapter is Martial Master Sumi, Chapter 5, or good old MMA, because you just gotta love the abbreviation there. But last chapter, we saw um, that Yuda, um, Nito's friend, ended up going to this gym, sort of help being run by Kazuto, and Kazuto beat the snot out of him, and Nito got very upset at him. And this chapter sort of brings that back up, as he was like, You've crossed a line, Kazuro! As Kazuro's just like, oh yeah, you want to fight? As we sort of get this whole idea of, okay, yeah, if you want to fight me, Nido, you need to go through this other guy. And this other guy is named Hiroki Doi, age 22, and he is a sort of a part of the team that Kazuro is part of, right? And this is a very interesting chapter because we get a backstory for this um, Hi Hiroki guy. And we pretty much learned that eventually that he was in high school or whatever. And this junior high student, Kazuro, came up being like, Hey, I want to fight you. You look strong. Um, if you win, I'll give you all the money in my wallet. They ended up having sort of a clash of fists as they got to fighting. And, yeah, he complete, completely beat him. And, oh, Hiroki was just pretty much like, Oh, okay, then I want to be like him. So we ended up joining a martial arts gym. And eventually solved this same guy was Kazuro. And then he was like, he does MMA. And eventually tried to meet with him. And yeah, they ended up joining together sort of in a team. And Kazuro sort of taught him a lot of stuff. And pretty much Kazuro is just like, hey, Nito, you beat up this dude, I'll fight you next. And as we go through the chapter, we sort of get a whole thing where um, Yuta is just like, and Nao is also there. And the two of them are just like, hey, don't actually do this. Manito's too fired up, so they're sort of wait, waiting for this time, but Nito's is like, I don't care, I'm gonna go beat him to a pulp, as they get ready to go and fight, and pretty much Nito demolishes Hiroi in just like, or Hiroki, in the first like, m single move, and pretty much Nito's is like, I'm Kazuro's family, so it's up to me as his family to deal with him, and that's the whole thing of, alright, Kazuro, I'm about to fuck you up, and that's the whole thing. I sort of do like how evil Kazuro is being out, like made out to be, and I like his final line of chapters. This is all courtesy of the school of hard knocks, which is very interesting. So I'm sort of excited to see what happens next time. I am liking Martial Master Sumi as time goes on, but I'm sort of starting to feel it's sort of getting into this groove, and that I'm fine with it staying in this groove. But I don't really know how it'll be going into the very far future. Next chapter was Tin Maku Cinema, chapter 14, where we get a very interesting chapter where it starts off with Kurai talking with um, director Yukio and Minori, and it eventually gets to uh, the shoot with everybody here Akitsu, Bido Shino, and Hajime himself, as they are all filming at. Akito's house, and it's just this whole thing of making a set look nice and pretty and appealing to the eye on screen. And yeah, Nagisa or Karai is having a fun time over her summer break. If you want to hear me talk more about depth in this chapter, I will have a video up on a channel here, if it's not up already in a few days, talking about Tenmaku Cinema Chapter 14. Um, so if you want to hear my expanded thoughts, you can just go there to listen to it. But I think this is an awesome chapter. Next chapter is Kill Blue Chapter 13, where last time we saw that Tin Matindo was getting his shit pushed in. And we start off this chapter very interestingly with a color page because, yeah, Kill Blue is doing super successfully. Like, Tinmaku Cinema isn't doing the best, New Age Exorcist isn't doing the best, and Do Retry out of that whole sort of small group. Kill Blue is definitely doing really good. And while I personally enjoy Tenmaku Cinema, and maybe even know his exes just how bad it is, I do feel like Kill Blue is a very interesting series. And this chapter sort of is a big deal of, oh, look at Shin. Shin is the guy with always the pacifier in. He lost his pacifier, so he can't play to his utmost in this sort of soccer match thing. So while, um, oh geez, what's his name? Odagami, the main character guy. I don't know why I blanked on his name there. But while Odagami and this other guy are fighting with Tinma, 
sort of just going through. Um, what ended up happening is Norrin and a few of her friends have to go get their past fire for Shin. They eventually take it over to Shin, and Shin gets it back on, and oh, look at that. Shin's all cool again, as Odagami and the rest of them are going at it. And eventually, it's just more stuff where, all right, Tinma is ready to fight as he sort of kicks a ball all the way up into the ceiling, and we see, like, the final page of the chapter is Tinma just sort of just sitting here, like, are you ready to fight? Because I am, as we hit this soccer ball, has just been completely ripped into. It is just a really funny and interesting visual, and yeah, Tinma's just made out to be such a bad evil guy, and I just can't wait till he eventually joins the main crew, because it is objectively pretty funny. And with that, what do we got next? Next is Nui's Exorcist Chapter 10, which is all about the beach episode. Would you look at that, right? So we pretty much open up the chapter with more of stuff with Gakuro can't look at girls in swimsuits because of previous trauma. It's made just to be a big joke. And um, Shiroha, which is the sort of girl we're looking at now who's going to be fighting with Gakuro in a few things here. Uh, I think the other one is Suo. So we sort of see it, Sue up being like, oh hey, you guys dug pretty deep, can we put our beach umbrella in now? And Gakuro is sort of having a problem looking at her. And as it sort of just goes through, we sort of see that Shiroha and Suo sort of just go back and forth talking with Gakuro. And the, there's the whole thing of her new it's like, oh I'm sure they're going to be at the beach, they won't wear swimsuits. And eventually we get this other team of exorcists in here. And um, the, pretty much the main one's name is Koga. And they're pretty much all just going around. And Gakuro sort of has this previous trauma. And there's this whole co competition between all of these other exorcists. Um, Koga going against Shiroha and Gakuro. And pretty much the whole chapter is Gakuro sort of getting up over this whole idea of, hey, I need to be more self, not self-conscious about all the girls in swimsuits, oh my gosh. And eventually teaming up with Shiroha to actually fight and win this championship. Because he needs to, to be able to be and to win against Shiroha using Nui's power here in a few chapters. To be honest, I sort of enjoyed this chapter. While it still is my worst chapter of the week, because objectively, the series isn't great. I actually sort of did enjoy it just for, okay, this trauma, I can sort of see where it's coming from, and while it is played up as a joke, I do sort of understand it, and alrighty, look at that, Gakuro and Shiroha are about to team up to fight against these people. I actually enjoyed it, so don't hate on me, please. It's Fabricant 100, chapter number 30, as we see in the beginning of this chapter that Fabricant 100 is still completely destroying this upper Fabricant that we, she's fighting against. As we, the chapter has only learned, this Fabricant is actually Fabricant number 78. And being this is a strong Fabricant, yeah, Fabricant 100 is making very quick work of her. But as time goes on, she completely destroys the core of this Fabricant. And goes on through to try to fight more of this um, changing, body changing double Fabricant. As you see that she is also getting completely wrecked also. And as this is going on, she gets lured into a room with a bunch of mirrors in it. So there seems to be a bunch of fabricants everywhere. And it's like, alright, which fabric 100 is the real fabric 100 as it keeps going on here. But eventually beside fabric 100, um, Kugi appears. And he uses his power of Oculus Prison. Which pretty much can detect anything that's within a range in a 2 meter space. And pretty much, he's just like, alright, here's the thing. It won't cut down all the mirrors in this place. We can at least tell what's real and what is actually fake. As we see that the only reason he is still alive, being that he got completely stabbed through last time, is because he was able to sense it and move his body out of the way in time to not get hit by a vital in a vital organ to sort of block the attack. But we see Ayako is also here being helped car carried by a Ashibi. But she could not do that same exact fate. She couldn't avoid it even though it was coming from her front. But she also uses Oculus Prison. Sort of making this even bigger and better. As we sort of see that Oculus like, Hey Kugi, 8 o'clock. As we see this Fabricant is there. Kugi does a really cool slash as he goes through. And I don't think kills this Fabricant yet since we don't see the core shattered. But yeah, 
slices this fabric into, and it's just like, and Ox is like, when it comes down to me and my brother, I want him to be the one who lives to see tomorrow. So, it looks like it very much is possible that Ayako will die, and that Kugi will continue on as a main character in her stead. I don't really want to see either of them die, because the, they are probably my two favorite characters in this series. I really do like Kugi, and I really do like Ayako also. But we'll just see what has to happen next time in chapter 31. But overall, I really enjoyed both Kugi and Ayako this chapter by far. The next chapter is Akane Banashi chapter 70. As as we just keep on going through it, we pretty much learn more about what I, um, Akane thinks of her dad's rock goes. We also start this page, this chapter with a color page, which we've now gotten in our two in a row in Akane Banashi. This series is doing insanely well for Jump to get two whole color pages back to back again. Like, that is just crazy. But we just get more on how Akane views her father Shinta's art as it just goes through. And pretty much the whole idea is that Shinta, Shinta's Rakugo was really weak. And that's what Akane loved about it was the weakness in her Akugo. And it's just a really awesome thing to see of, yeah, her father's weakness in her Akugo is a beautiful thing. And that's what charmed her. And she is using that weakness even now in this match of Rakugo in the Kraku Cup. And it's just very interesting to see. And we even see that. One of the other guys, a person who really taught her the story of Changing Time and all of that, who was again Mikaru, he's pretty much the one here just saying, hey, she finally figured out what it means to make that rock go around and she did it. So, good for her. I know I really summed that up quick, but there's not really just a whole lot to say about this chapter. While I do think it was a really good chapter of Akane Banashi, one of the best we've had in a while, it's that same deal of. Akane Banashi is good. I'm gonna read it every week. I'll just read it then. Is that something where I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta read the next chapter. What's gonna happen next? Oh. But next time we will get to the results for the Kraku Cup and see who is going on to the main match. I personally think that there is a good chance here that Akane will lose and it will be Hikaru going on there. And that Akane will probably lose by just a few points or just by a large margin altogether. But we'll see next time when it comes to Kane Banashi. Next chapter was Blue Box chapter 109, where we pretty much get that whole idea of, man, Taiki is now 16 years old, and he has a girlfriend. Oh my goodness, Taiki is so happy. And pretty much there's the whole thing of where um, Chinatsu's like, hey, Taiki, remember, leave your schedule for a night open, as we see some stuff's going on with his mom when she's like, Oh my gosh, um, hey, your aunt's having a child, so we've, we've something maybe going on there, maybe home early, maybe home late, don't really know everything's going on, right? And we get a whole bunch of things, and whenever Taiki gets to school, Kyo ends up giving him some chocolate, um, there's a whole thing there with Ayame too, and even Hina gives him some chocolate, and it's a very nice thing where, um, Hina gives him three chocolates saying, hey, happy third birthday, right? And... Her and the two of them sort of bicker, so we sort of see that Hina is totally over the whole thing of liking Taiki, so it's nice to see, and being that we haven't seen much of Hina recently, I'm sort of glad to see her sort of back in the story, even if just for a small second here, right? But as everything's going on, um, Taiki's walking home, and he's like, oh man, what's gonna be going on with um, me and Shinatsu? Is she gonna give me a birthday, a hug? What's going on here, right? And all of a sudden, he gets a call from his mom being like, Hey, hey, um, your aunt went into labor early, so we're going to be home really, really late. Um, Chinatsu is cooking you dinner, right? Um, just go home, it'll just be you and two. Alrighty. But look at that. What does that mean? Taiki and Chinatsu are going to be home alone on Taiki's birthday. Oh, man, what's going to happen here? And we end off the chapter with Taiki walking into his house and Chinatsu just being like, Hey, welcome back. And Taiki finally realizing, Oh, crap, is this going to be the two of us? So where is this going to shake down? I'm excited to see. This was a really good chapter of Wubox again. And as per usual, I think this week was just really good. But the next chapter is the Elusive Samurai chapter number 118. 
where we get more of that stuff with Akie, the person who we met last time. The person has a really big aura, and we pretty much go through and we learn a lot about her, and also how she sort of bested Takeuji at one point. And there's a bunch of strategy talk as we also see that um, one of the b big prominent figures, um, the one boy who was always there, um, Shiba Iniga, who was that sort of strategist who's all, always put up to be something more, during this two years has become something more and is now going to be a person that will truly rival both Akie and Tokuyuki's forces. And as it keeps going on, we eventually see something. At the end, we're not just like, oh man, who do I help out here? And all the elusive warriors just going on. And yeah, it's finally time in December of 1337 for Hojo Tukioki to take off his arms to fight another battle. And that's really the entire chapter. There's not really a whole lot to speak on here. It's really just, oh yeah, here's a bunch of information setting up some battles that'll be happening in the future. It's just that sort of chapter for the elusive samurai. Not much else to say. End things off here with Witch Watch chapter number 117, which pretty much tells the continued story of Miharu versus Rabuka that we sort of saw the beginnings of last time. And we pretty much learn a, about, a lot about um, Rabuka here, being that um, she pretty much harmed a lot of her friends whenever she was younger just because she has this type of magic called Flash Magic. And it really just screwed her life over, made her not be able to hang out with people because she had this trigger that she really couldn't control too well. And we just sort of get a lot of backstory about her. And she read this comic that ended up sort of influencing her a lot as, yeah, she ends up joining the bad guys and meets up with Ran eventually. And yeah, ends up joining them. And it's just a big fight between both Miharu and Rabuka. Miharu just keeps getting bested between, yeah, the sun is coming out. And not even to mention that his um, sucking powers aren't working on him. Because he has to get up close to Rabuka to be able to use them. But he can't get close enough to actually use them. Since before he gets there, she always cuts him down with her flash magic. So as it's going on, it's a big thing of, alright, what's her trigger for um, her using her flash magic? Because every time she pulls out her sword and puts it back in her sheath. So what's going on with that? Well, we see that eventually Miharu puts a pebble in her sheath, so he can't use that. And she's like, oh no, what's going on here? As we see it, no, that is not the trigger for the flash magic to occur. And we see that, man, Miharu gets a really grisly scar on his arm, and it just keeps bleeding off and bleeding off. And Miharu's like, damn it. My healing isn't going to work here. I'm really screwed. And Rabuka's are like, oh man, hey, you wuss. I guess you don't have what it takes here. Spoiled rich kid. Oh uh, man, I'm going to just cut you down now. As Mihar's is like, man, I bet your parents love you too. Like, those braces aren't cheap. And she's like, time to die. He's like, time to slice you to bits. As you see Mihar is sitting here and, oh no, there's a flying hand with blood, blood dripping out of it, right? As we see, this is actually a hand of Fran. Because Fran and Dr. Jekyll are also there to aid Miharu in this big fight. It's a really awesome thing to get this chapter to see. Man, both Fran and Jekyll are here. That's awesome. And I sort of just called it like Miharu and the gang. Because I felt like they did a really good week in the chapter in general. And I thought this was a pretty good chapter of Witch Watch. And that's where we end it. There was a lot of good stuff this week, like, through and through, and very little bad. Like, I really feel like the worst thing we had was, like, um, the elusive samurai in terms of just, yeah, it was a dry, bland chapter. And even so, I still put New Age Extra slower, just because of, that's what the series is. But going through my actual rankings for this week, my top three were Tinmaku Cinema, My Hero Academia, and One Piece. Again, I just feel like there were a bunch of really awesome moments there where Garp, look, Garp looked really cool. Uraka looked awesome. And also, Tamaku Cinema was just a really good chapter. Even though I didn't talk about it much here, I'll talk about it more in my actual video on it. It was just a really good chapter looking into things. Next up was Fabricant 100, Undead Luck, Black Clover, Kill Blue, Witch Watch, Akai Banashi, Ichinose's Family, Deadly Sins, Blue Box, Martial Master, Sumi, Elusive Samurai, and Nui's Exorcist. Just again, just going through that, Fabric 100 was really good, and just a chapter I really enjoyed just seeing the dichotomy between Ayako and Kugi fighting this other Fabricant. 
And then Luck was just awesome with the moments for Fing. Black Clover also showing up really carried it. Kill Blue was just very entertaining. Just through and through, just seeing everything with, all right, Shin, what problems is he having? And, oh, would you look at that? Tinma Tindo is just so stupidly evil. To eventually Witch Watch, just being like, all right, this is where the chapters sort of start to get not as good, but still really awesome going to Akai Banashi and Ichinose's family. All the things I talked about, and eventually just getting down to like Blue Box, Martial Master Sumi, which were good chapters, but mainly just a lot of setup for next time. To Elusive Samurai and Noise Exorcist, which was a decent chapter in its own right. Not even to mention Naruto to War Off in the Spire, which was also just a very entertaining thing through and through. But, well, who's my MVP for this week? This week, I chose it as Uraka for My Hero Academia. While I think there were very many good options, such as Garp, Asta, Fing, um, Tin Matendo, Kugi, and then Miharu into Gang, I felt like Uraka had the most complete sort of character moment throughout it. Sort of just ending off sort of what'll probably be her storyline for my hero. I mean, we probably won't get too much more of her. And that's really all I've got to say on that sort of note. Now, thank you for watching this video on all of this issue number 33 of 2022 of Weekly Shonen Jump. If you liked what, how I talked about them here, we've got a few more videos on the channel going through sort of like uh, a few past issues of Shonen Jump like I did this time talking about them. I also have videos on the channel where I cover a few of these series independently of this, such as My Hero and Tenmaku Cinema, not to mention other Shonen Jump titles such as World Trigger, and also Oshinoko videos which I do every so often also here on the channel. So again, thank you very much for watching this, I had a very fun time recording it, and even though I'm sitting in my car which is about 100 degrees as I'm recording this, I mean, I've been sweating this entire time, hope you guys enjoyed this, and hey, Next time, I'll be back with Flukely Shonen Jump issue number 34 of 2023. And great issue jump. And with that, this will be Gold Plasma 231. Out.